Welcome one last time to the climactic finale of this year's Indie Ween. It's that special time of year where rather than spend $60 on a AAA game and feel disappointed, I'm gonna show you a bunch of indie horror games over the course of this month, which when we combine everything we've seen are cheaper than a single AAA title. It was actually so easy this year that even without using a free game, I had to add an extra game to the rotation just to get past 50 bucks. We are swimming in good indies. Now, I want to take it back to the second indie ween we ever did and cover a little game that's finally out of early access. World of Horror. You have to say it like that. The title's in all caps. World of Horror is a horror roguelike game that uses one and two bit aesthetic to help capture the feeling of being the protagonist in a Junji Ito story. It's played in a sort of first person adventure with minimalistic animation and uses a combination of text and really spooky imagery to convey that you're in for a bad time. World of Horror requires a lot of smart planning and time management as there's an elder god rapidly approaching the small coastal town you're investigating the paranormal in and if that doom meter hits 100 you're gonna wish that you drop to zero stamina or reason now before we get going i'm gonna tell y'all one more time about sorceress sorceress is an immersive sim inspired by dark messiah that's running its kickstarter right now and could really really use your help there's a free demo on the steam page which is a whole lot of fun just to goof around in, and Wava Boy et al. have worked really hard on getting this game going. This weekend is the final weekend of the Kickstarter, so it is now or never. Please, for me, at least check out the demo and maybe kick a few dudes off ledges and into spiky walls. If you're curious as to why I'm going so hard for this game, well, for one, it's the baller thing to do, and I've pledged my own money, and I have not been compensated in any way whatsoever to do this. Wava didn't even ask me to do this, and I was planning on doing it from the moment I saw that he was going to launch the Kickstarter this month. Part of being the de facto Immersive Sim YouTuber is understanding that if Immersive Sims don't get made, I don't have cool stuff to make videos about. So I gotta help things however I can, and frankly, we can no longer rely on the AAA scene to make cool M Sims anymore. So I gotta help things get going however I can so that I can make cool videos for you, and we can all have cool games to play. Simple as. Now let's get back to World of Horror. So like we were saying earlier, World of Horror is a roguelite. Pick your character, pick the Elder God that will be your antagonist, optionally pick a backstory to make things spicier. Then set the difficulty, set the timeline, and let her rip. You'll get five mysteries that you'll need to solve, picked from a pool, and just like you might get different four layouts in The Binding of Isaac or Streets of Rogue, you can also re-roll at the beginning. But before you consider if you want to do that or not, make sure that you first open the cupboard in the living room of your apartment for a useful character-specific item, and then go into your closet because even if you don't want to pick a cool outfit to peep the horror in, you'll want to examine the little robot on the shelf and get that money inside. Each of these five mysteries are self-contained stories that in turn are influenced by the god you chose at the beginning, and each one of them can and will be able to kill you before you even get close to the final encounter for each mystery. Each mystery has a side quest ranging from doing extra investigations in certain areas that are maybe a bit out of the way, but still something you should do, to collecting rumors around the schoolyard or sacrificing your items. The main part of investigating mysteries is going to be going to relevant areas according to the unfold plot and investigating them. There are a few mysteries that take place in their own special game worlds, uh, like outside of town, and also one where some unknown force a cask of amontillados you into your apartment, but that sort of technically takes place in the city. Most of what you see here is going to be some text and images that really make it easy to miss the horror if you're not paying attention, but you'll also get encounters at nearly every location. More on those later. The old gods also aren't exactly sitting still while this is all happening. Between mysteries, if you manage to survive more than one mystery that is, the old god will push back against your progress and make something weird happen. Sometimes it's disabling the receiver antenna that connects the town to the outside world. Sometimes it's making the nice little doggy that runs the shop go on vacation. Sometimes it's making the water real icky so you can't take a bath and recover between mysteries. This stuff can really add up after a while, especially towards the end game. And frankly, there's no shame in bumping down from cultist to initiate difficulty just so you got a shot at getting into the lighthouse because, well, for the sake of footage, that's what I had to do. 
Now that you've got an idea of how the game works, let's zero in on those characters, old gods, and backstories. Each of these have a special set of encounters tied to them, and when you mix and match all three possible variants, you've got a whole lot of variants for a whole lot of adventures. To start with the characters, each has their own strength and weakness, just like any other roguish game, but most will also have the special effects and starting items. The photographer, for instance, starts with a camera and has a good perception stat. The aspiring idol has very high charisma and starts with a random companion, but she's cursed, and if you don't have at least two followers by the end of each mystery, she'll take a reason penalty. The medical student starts with a very high knowledge stat, as well as the scalpel, one of the best knowledge scaling weapons in the game. I think you're getting the idea now, so we'll move on. Some characters, like the priest or the heiress, even have their own unique stat mechanics separate from the normal stat block everyone else has to make things extra, extra spicy. But I suggest getting really familiar with how the game works before you get into them. The gods are a similar story, except this time around you're choosing what exactly the cultists in the lighthouse are trying to summon and how that's going to screw you over. The first handful you're given are simple enough and provide some pretty clear options on who you should and should not pair them with. For instance, it's probably not a good idea to choose the god that adds a doom penalty to casting spells if you want to play as a transfer student whose whole thing is being good at magic but not much else. And finally, if you're feeling up to it, there are the backstories. Most backstories are mixed bags, like the first one that makes you especially prone to injuries during combat, but also gives you a hefty XP bonus at the start of the run, or outright challenges, like one of the backstories being a curse placed upon you, making you automatically fail any and all encounters during the mystery. The modifiers are mostly straightforward to unlock because you get one, and then you unlock the other by playing that one, and so on and so forth. Obviously, this gets a lot harder as you go deeper into the pool and have heftier challenges. So once you've got your character, your god, and maybe a backstory if you're feeling saucy, it's time to solve the mysteries. Let's get through some encounters. Encounters are what you'd expect them to be from a video game or tabletop perspective, except maybe instead of a 1d12 chance, it's more like a 1d4 or maybe even a coin flip. You won't always get them, but you'll be getting them more than enough to keep things interesting. Encounters aren't just combat, but also presenting choices in the investigation, or straightforward buffs or penalties. Yeah, you'll probably see a number of these more than a few times, particularly if you like playing as a certain character, as most characters do have their character-specific encounters added to the pool when you choose them, and are near guaranteed to show up. There's a similar thing with specific gods, but I found that god-related encounters tend to not show up as often, but when they do, you're not gonna have a good time. A lot of these encounters are also just good old-fashioned dice rolls gussied up with the image and flavor text, as you do in a video game, and if you want, you can even go into the options and enable a feature that lets you see the minutiae of your roll versus the modifiers. However, most non-combat encounters will have the option that, say through a perk, item, or even a traveling companion, to do some third thing. For example, if you've got the map equipped, you can get a small bonus when you encounter a strange part of town instead of rolling to see how screwed you get because you can mark your way and realize something isn't right here. Also, there's combat. I'm not going to get too much into combat immediately since I want to talk about it a bit more in a sec in the spooky section, but combat is well fleshed out. Everything will cost units of time, which you have an allowance of 200 time units per turn, and certain perks or statuses can affect how fast you perform these actions. You either have a melee weapon, the ability to spiritually sever a ghost from this realm, or a good old-fashioned kick if you've got nothing else. Weapons all have operative stats which improve their accuracy, or even special effects like the shovel giving you a chance to find some cash out of combat. You also have the option to command your allies to attack for you in your stead without using your items, which once you get past five followers, which yes, can be done fairly easily once you know how to do the quest right, becomes second to only the hunting rifle as the single most powerful attack in game. Theoretically, with the right buffs and min-maxing, it could possibly even surpass the hunting rifle in sheer damage, but that's something for you guys to hash out in the comments. At least on the lower to middle difficulties, it's surprisingly pretty easy easy to one turn or even one hit enemies if you get a good thing going, but I think that's sort of an unofficial tenet of roguelike games where every run has the potential to allow you to become a 300 mile an hour steamroller mid-game if the stars align. And now we get to the good stuff. The Spookies. If it wasn't clear by now, World of Horror is very, very inspired by Junji Ito. Heck, you can meet an analog of him in-game. The main mode of this game is encountering things that aren't quite right at their most mundane, and outright body horror is the norm. World of Horror. 
draws heavily from Japanese folklore with the creepy factor cranked up to 11. There's plenty of references to classic Edo works like the Enigma of Amagara Fault to name the most basic, and I'm sure you've already seen quite a few in just general gameplay footage I've got going in the background. And while I'm sure you've already thought of it, there is definitely some Lovecraftian influence here with the theming and the player character going up against an outer god, or an entity older than mankind can look back through science or mysticism that has only become aware of our insignificant world because some idiots are trying to summon it. Heck, there's an old god you can unlock that is essentially Cthulhu with the serial numbers filed off. There's also a fair bit of spooky stuff coming from the sea, as well as a whole group of encounters which are basically the player character haphazardly wandering into another world. And some of the big bads will drag you into other planes too. Do not drink anything you bottle from the other world unless you have the proper device. World of Horror! Also, it does a great job at integrating the spookies right into combat. Despite everything being just actions and roles, there's a lot of tension to be had when it comes to if you're able to land enough hits to survive. Things get pretty close at times, and any enemy can be a lethal encounter. There's a lot of desperation in combat, especially early on when you haven't had a chance to put a few levels into your character to get better accuracy ratings, or worse, combat happens so quickly you did not have the opportunity to go shopping and find something to defend yourself with. Sure, you can take basically a whole turn to find an improvised weapon and equip it in the next Next turn, but how useful is a stick or a broken bottle gonna be against the apartment stalker and his baseball bat? And just because that's not enough, not all encounters will have the same outcomes every time you do it. You might find yourself clicking through events and expecting one thing to happen, but suddenly a third option that you've never seen before pops up. Some of these are related to characters, some are related to the old god, some are just good old fashioned crit fails. Because yes, in World of Horror, you are not safe from rolling a nat 1 and there will be punishments for it. And to put a nice little bow on it, the visuals in World of Horror are amazingly spooky. Like, I really don't even know what else to say since you've been looking at this whole video, but in case you've got me in another tab or on another screen while you're working, I'll give her a cry. World of Horror very much feels like Haunted PS1's underutilized cousin, Haunted Macintosh. It wrings every drop possible of atmosphere and spookiness out of an extremely limited 2-bit or even 1-bit color palette to create imagery that's just detailed enough to slip past the uncanny valley and act as if there is something very unsettling going on with an old Apple II. The pixel art is on point, and between this and Faith, we can see the idea of less being more put into practice. This coupled with how when playing World of Horror, you have a multitude of ever-present threats coming after you makes for a high tension experience at almost all times. There's trying to figure out what to do about the outer god coming after this world, but in the meantime, there's been a rash of disappearances at your school because that old dare game you all just used to play for fun has suddenly become real and there is a demon in the school. There's one other thing. Something I wasn't able to fully document because while I did log a solid 12 hours of playtime since 1.0 dropped on Thursday, it requires some pretty bad RNG for it to happen. You can try to manipulate this into happening, but I gotta be honest with you, this thing spooks me enough into actively making an effort to avoid it. There is an entity only known as something truly evil, and once you attract its attention by sheer bad luck, you're playing a game of hide and seek for the rest of your run. You cannot escape something truly evil. Once it has you in its sights, there is no undoing. Doing it. You cannot even save and quit out of your current adventure and try again later. Something truly evil has a counter on the top of the screen once you have its attention, but after one it stops bothering to use the counter and instead decides to take over your UI. Its visage infests your icons. It'll replace the images on item descriptions with its own horrifying face. It'll find out where you live if you try to rest at a certain point during investigations, and when it knows it finally has you alone, you're not exactly going to be fighting it. All of something truly evil stats are just quote unquote, found you. You cannot attack something truly evil. You can only bleed for it or weep in its presence and hope that your suffering is enough to sate it before you perish. No, the Athotu flame trick no longer works anymore and the patch notes literally nerfed the power of friendship. It's futile anyway, because another thing they do is that something evil will heal itself back to full HP anytime it drops below 50 health points. As a point of reference, Akamanto, known for being one of the more bulky final bosses of a mystery, only has 32 HP at normal difficulty. 
Something Truly Evil has 99 HP, but that's more of a suggestion that this thing is invincible. You might get lucky and survive if you've got some very, very high stats and you encounter it late in the game, but it's entirely in your best interest to only go looking for Something Truly Evil once you are a very, very well-seasoned investigator. Also, as a side note, just because I know some people are going to look it up and notice it, I checked just out of curiosity and it turns out that Something Truly Evil has existed in World of Horror over a year before the Mandela catalog first started. It's just a sheer coincidence that something truly evil and some alternates resemble each other because, well, it's certainly a freaky look. But wait, there's more! World of Horror has a bunch of extra things in it from some pretty intense in-game achievements to challenge modes to even an entirely different in-game timeline that remixes a lot of the mysteries. Let's take a brief look at those challenges first, and I do mean brief because all of these kick my ass. Challenge modes are built to be especially punishing for the seasoned player. It puts you in scenarios that are often the worst case scenario for the player characters, such as the Yakuza driver not being allowed to smoke anymore, or playing as the aspiring idol, a character thriving off having lots of followers, except in this iteration, suddenly everyone in the town has vanished into thin air. Messed up stuff like that, or whatever the heck the med student is trying to do in her challenge. Personally, I think I need to invest a bit more time into mastering how World of Horror plays before I'm really ready for these. And then we've got that alternate timeline, the Occult Capital of Japan. Occult Capital of Japan remixes all the mysteries in-game and adds new endings to many of them. There's already quite a few ways each mystery can end, but this is more of a bonus on top of the good, well, relatively speaking, endings. It also adds new encounters or outright challenges. For example, here is the Scissor Lady from the tutorial mission if you're playing normally. Here she is again in the Occult Capital of Japan timeline. Check that diary if you want any hope of defeating her. And while I admit I haven't played any of these yet, since World of Horror doesn't have workshop support, there are custom mysteries that you can add and even I think some custom items and characters. I saw that there's a Nexus Mods page dedicated to custom stories, but I'll be honest with you here, I was more focused on getting the vanilla experience for this video and even straight up deleted my previous in-game progress from when I did the early access video to make sure that the experience was fresh in my head. I felt that it might misrepresent what you guys might play if I came from a game file that already had most of the unlocks in it. And while this is the release version of World of Horror at 1.0, it looks like there's still more to come. There's currently an unselectable mode that hits at being a sort of story scenario mode. Perhaps uh, canon stories for each of the characters, like a combination of mysteries specific to them. And who knows, there might be more. Also, I totally forgot, but there's endless mode, just because why not, where you just see how long you can go before the Elder God or something else gets you. As with all roguelites, there's a ton of stuff you can theoretically keep mixing and matching to play for dozens, if not hundreds of hours, if you're really into this game. And finally, if the core game, the alternate timeline, Chivo hunting, and all that good stuff is just not enough for you, there are a ton of Easter eggs to find in World of Horror. Not just the Junji Ito stuff either, or other horror stuff, but nods to other games. For instance, there's an achievement later down the line that you can unlock by playing as the priest character with the spider god on hardest difficulty called And from what I remember from the early access version of the priest, they've added a whole new faith mechanic specific to them, and he generally seems a lot similar to John Ward from Faith. Also, if you're in the occult capital timeline, the cursed heiress will have a very special outfit that confirms that Poland 2 is real. I feel kind of bad about this though, because even in the Perry Discord, some people mistook this outfit for a reference to Signalis. So two years ago, I said this game was a buy at your own risk since there were some issues going on in early access. But now that everything's been sorted and this game is released, I cannot recommend it enough. There is so much more stuff to do since I first played with more mysteries, more characters, more gods, a working save system, more fun little Easter eggs, just so much more. We've played a lot of good games this Indie Ween, but World of Horror is definitely the best in show. It's mainly on PC, but there are Switch and PlayStation ports, which will have a physical release if that is your thing. Now let's run up that final total. We started with Alyssa at 1799, 
and then added Endoparasitic for $9.99, bringing us to $27.98. Then we added Pig Saw and additionally Chop Goblins, just cause we could, at $4.99 each, to get up to $37.96. And now, we finally arrive at World of Horror, which is now retailing for $19.99 at its full release price, which brings us up to a total of $57.95 Freedom Bucks. We got five awesome horror games for less than the price of a single AAA title, and that's assuming that the AAAs are only asking for 60 bucks still instead of that 70 or 90 dollar crap and you know what's even better world of horror is on sale right now back at its early access price of 14.99 which it will remain until tuesday november the 2nd which brings us back down to 52 dollars and 95 cents man even with tacking on an extra game this year we killed it and that'll do us for this indie weed i'm so happy i was able to figure out how to make this work again as individual videos and even after 11 years of putting videos on youtube i am still finding ways to grow and improve and i'm happy that you've been here to help me figure that out stay tuned for the halloween special special that I promised you back in Halloween in July, which might be able to get out next weekend, but maybe not because uh, it's going to be a big one. Then we'll get Fortune's Run, as many of you have been asking me for it, and maybe a revision of the MSIM tier list after that. I'm not exactly sure when I want to put that one out because some games are right on the verge of being released, like at the end of the year, and I don't want to leave them out of the video. I also want to say that I'm so happy so many of you enjoyed that Kenshi video, particularly the story I told. I do a lot of writing just for my my job here, but I don't get to do a lot of storytelling and this was a fun outlet for me. I actually am working on a novel off and on that I sort of first started doing in early 2019 after bits and pieces of like beginning prompts I had in our creative writing class I took to fulfill some course requirements morphed into world building which morphed into nearly 250 pages and counting on the first draft which I'd say it's about two thirds of the way to being done. I mentioned this because while I still plan to put out videos in November, it's not going to be at this pace because I'm going to do the NaNoWriMo this year, but instead of just trying to like shoot out a novel from whole cloth, I'm going to use it as a challenge to get this damn draft finished. It's more of a passion project of mine though, and you'll most likely never ever see it. But for now, let's sign off. Remember that no matter what you do, be it a little webcomic, a GoPro footage of you going on like cool motorcycle rides, creative writing, or whatever it is that is your passion. Passion. What you do should never be called content. It is art. Content is a word that has been twisted into a means of grinding up all your passions, aspirations, and skills into a gray slop that is meant for nothing more than mindless consumption to enrich some boardroom that will never know your name. Your art is inalienably a reflection of you through your experiences, your passions, and your soul by the very nature of its creation, and nothing about you deserves to be ground up into content. So get out there and fight against the contentification of everything. Fight for yourself by fighting for your art and make the world a wonderful place in the process. Stay saucy, everyone. The Long has relocated. He is no longer on the yogurt box. He's now about five feet away. Important Long update. He sleeps quite soundly for a murderer. This boy just... You know, it's funny, he's only annoyed by the sound of the air conditioner at night. Because he just screams when it's on. But now that we're all up, he's like, okay. The adults are here. They're watching me. I don't have to panic. Just all that violence in there. Look at the little murder beans. Look at the little murder mouth. Look at all this violence. You know what? I know what I can do for revenge. It's my yogurt box now. You can't get me off here. I can get you off it, but you can't get me off it. I'm also going to touch your toe bean.